If you're a B2B business, a B2B tech company, or a B2B marketer, you're in the right place. Coming to you from Studio 26, this is the Interesting B2B Marketers Podcast, bringing you interesting contemporary takes, industry tips, guest interviews, and true stories from B2B marketers in the trenches. Now, here's your host, Steve Goldhaber. All right, hey everybody, welcome back to Studio 26 and the Interesting B2B Marketers Podcast. Excited about today's show, we've got kind of a fun special theme today, and Brian's going to walk us through a bunch of different B2B e-commerce related issues, challenges, opportunities, you know, whatever whatever we want to say. But Brian, welcome to the show. Steve, great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. Give us a quick 60 second overview of your background. All right. Well, 20 plus years in the e-commerce field, Steve. I was I started started when I was two. <laughs> <laughs> tells, you, tells you I just age myself now. It feels like, you know, I used to be one of the young guys in the in the late 90s and early 2000s when e-commerce was just coming to be. And so I got into it a long time ago, beginning of my career, finished grad school, started working for a company called AT&T, which at the time was, you know, putting broadband into, you know, businesses and eventually homes. And the internet was way slow back then and, and people were trying to figure out commerce. Well, over the course of my 20 years, I got into deeply into the e-commerce field. I ran e-commerce for several companies. Harbor Freight Tools, you might know, is a, hundreds of stores, actually over a thousand stores now across the United States, and ran their e-commerce business for a time, PacSun on the consumer side, and which is an apparel retailer. And then, you know, most recently, the last six, seven years, I've gotten into the B2B e-commerce side. I, I wrote a book about B2B e-commerce called Billion Dollar B2B e-commerce. And really, you know, what's fascinating about the B2B side and why I got into it is because there's so much opportunity for companies to transform their business using e-commerce, using digital you know, tools, both on the marketing and sales side to you know, really serve their customers better. And the ROI is enormous when companies do that. So I was privileged to get into a relatively early into a position um, where I was interviewing companies, working with some, some of the leading companies in the world on their digital transformation. So I've been doing that now for about six, seven years. And these days, I'm the managing partner of a company called Inceba. We work on e-commerce and Amazon specifically for B2B companies. And I also have a thought leadership series called Master B2B, where we take on some of these issues and talk about them with manufacturers and distributors. So All right. that's my background. Nice. All right, let's jump into case study number one. And this is the two fearful words of any B2B marketer, channel conflict. It's the nice way of saying, hey, we know, we know where our bread is buttered. I don't know. Is that the expression? But, hey, yeah. but no, no we want to do something else. We don't want to upset anyone, but we still want to grow our business. So that's the essence of, of this case study. So go ahead and take it away. Yeah, Steve. Well, you know, it's interesting because there's a, an enormous fear of channel conflict, as you mentioned, particularly amongst branded manufacturers, right? You know, for many, many years, these companies have gotten their bread and butter, as you say, from, you know, tr traditional distribution, from retailers they sell to, from distributors or dealers, they stock the product and resell it. And that model is, is still very viable, but it's also changed. And, and, you know, manufacturers these days have a mandate to be thinking about well, how that end customer is really needing their product, wanting to learn about their product and buy the product. So, you know, we worked with a, a commercial lawnmower manufacturer. This is a company that makes, you know, they make products that are used to cut enormous lawns. They, you've seen these things. They go 35 miles an hour over the lawn and there's zero turns. They spin them and they spin around really fast and they, they really efficiently cut lawns. And so this is a, a global company. A lot of their market is here in the U.S. and North America. And they have dealers and distributors all over the U.S. in particular, but also the world. And so thinking about the, you know, the, the management, family-owned business, management is thinking about how do we, they know these things are happening in digital. They know that if customers want to buy on e-commerce channels like Amazon and other places, but they're also, you know, 90, 98% of their revenue is coming from these traditional dealers. So how does a company like that, that is, I don't want to say beholden, but really has traditionally worked through a traditional sales force and marketed to these folks and sold to these folks, and the dealer is really the one that the relationship with the end customer, how do they enable, you know, e-commerce? How, how do they embrace digital for the business while also, you know, maintaining those relationships and deepening those relationships? They were terrified of channel conflict, yeah. right? The instant that, you know, go over here, they're not the only company that makes these things. There's other big manufacturers out there that make these, these lawnmowers. So the way they started, which is really fascinating, they started with Amazon. They said, well, number one, we don't have any real technology tools or knowledge or 
organizational muscle to get into this business and understand how to market to customers, how to reach these customers through search engines, how to sell through e-commerce and digital channels. So the reason they started with Amazon, number one, so you got this next generation, right? The third generation coming in. The folks are all, you know, Amazon shoppers, they're e-commerce people. They, they understand it natively because they grew up with it. Well, they said, let's start with Amazon because it'll help us make a case to the family, the, you know, the older generations of the family. Yep that people actually will buy our products this way. And the traffic was already there on Amazon. You know, the structure is there on Amazon too. You know, the infrastructure is in place, the buying infrastructure, Prime and all these things. They could use Amazon's fulfillment centers using Fulfilled by Amazon to fulfill the orders. And they launched this program. Now, they were nervous again about channel conflict. So they went slowly. They started with accessories and parts. And what they found was when they launched, they, they started to see orders come in and they looked at where those orders were coming from. And the fascinating thing they found is that most of these orders were, were places that were more than 70 miles away from any dealer location. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. So it's, yeah. So all incremental sales, they got two and a half years into this. They have zero complaints from their dealers. In fact, their dealers' e-commerce sales went up in part because Amazon, they improved their presence on Amazon. Well, most folks don't realize it, but Amazon is a search engine. It gets 70% of product search now. So at the end of the day, they're improving their presence in the market and it lifted their dealers' sales. Guess what? No complaints. And now they're launching direct e-commerce. Now they're going to be selling directly to end buyers and to their distributors and dealers through e-commerce or a B2B e-commerce site. You know, the third generation came in, he convinced the earlier generations, you know, the CEO and the, and the other C-levels that, you know, this is something that's real. We can sell our products this way and it's not going to completely disrupt our channel. Yeah. So, so it's, it, it's interesting. So I've, I, one of my clients a long time ago was not in this space, but a large B2B manufacturer relied heavily on distribution dealer network. And it's so funny because they had a similar approach. You know, they're like, well, maybe, maybe we just start with some parts and accessories. You know, it's always the low price point, non-threatening products. And then comes the real question, right? Which is the, okay, your big ticket item, are you going to do it? So help us understand, like, how did they make that decision to say, we're going after it, we're going to go after the big ticket stuff? Well, it was, it was a, you know, it was, it was a crawl, walk, run, right? So it was understanding, they, what they did was they incrementally added more product so they started with, again, the low price, as you mentioned, the parts, the, they added then accessories, which were, you know, the components, the other things that you could add to the, to the mowers. And now it's a matter of now they realize that people will buy these larger items online and they're not concerned as they were about the, you know, disintermediating the traditional dealer. What they've come to realize, Steve, is that the dealer and the distributor plays a different role. If the dealer and distributor really is adding value to that end customer, they're going to be able to they can still capture that sale because guess what? It's about service. It's about it recommendations, about how you utilize those products in the field, literally in the field. And this and that, if the distributor and the dealer are truly adding that kind of value, they're not going to lose the sale to any other kind of, you know, to the other types of uh, yep. e-commerce transactions. Because let's be honest, Amazon and e-commerce, they play, you know, when you need the product quickly in short order and typically in small quantities or even, you know, uh, want to place an order for convenience, because you already know what you want, even if it's a large high ticket item, they're, they're going to place that order you know, on e-commerce and they don't need a sales rep. They don't need a dealer. They don't need the consultative aspects. But if you're a distributor or dealer sitting out there and you're just, all you're doing is price and assortment, you're, you know, it's, it's you're low price and you're, and you're just making the product available. Guess what? E-commerce does that better. Marketplaces, Amazon, they'll do that better than you potentially. You've got to find a different way to differentiate if that's your, if that's your yep. business model. My opinion. Any any issues with this company experiencing showrooming? So showrooming is where essentially, you know, I go into the showroom because I want to kick the tires on something. I get educated by the sales force and then I go, all right, I'm good. I leave, I buy it online. Any Anything like that happen? Not anything measurably. You know, you can't assume that every sale in e-commerce or to Amazon or through Amazon is incremental because it's not. There is some channel shift. But, you know, again, not getting in the way of the customer is, is really, you know, the, the goal of the smart manufacturer in my, in my experience and what this company experienced. I would say actually, though, quite the opposite. What's fascinating about this too, Steve, is that when a company sells through Amazon, if they take the right approach, number one, they can, they can manage the pricing. So it's not a race to the bottom on price. But also, you know, if you take the seller central approach on Amazon, you can actually understand where those orders are going. You, you can actually get more information from, 
from an Amazon program than you can through a t- typical distribution or dealer channel. So guess what? When a customer buys something on Amazon, if it's shipped from the manufacturer to that end customer, they know exactly where it's going. And the dealer that's in that market who makes pro- who provides service, aftermarket service on this equipment, and this, this equipment stays in the field for 20 years, right? So there's a significant amount of service business attached to these, these lawnmowers. Well, that dealer, even though it was bought on Amazon, can now knows that that product is in that market and, and they can provide that service. Amazon is not providing service on lawnmowers mowers uh-huh. right so this is a so the point is that you know by by getting out of the way of the end customer let the customer buy where they want to buy i have another client that said you know i think one of the smartest things i've heard is we want to just be where the customer is whether that's on amazon in the dealer channel in home depot in lowe's and whatever you know whatever channel they're in we want to get out of the way of that customer and present our brand the best way we can and all of our differentiation points because at the end of the day the ultimate customer in our opinion has the power. And I agree with them. They now have the ability. They have so many channels they can buy from. This is transparency coming to B2B. It came to B2C a long time ago. It's now here in B2B. So it's interesting the dynamic. Awesome. All right, let's jump into case study number two. This is another story of a B2B company leveraging Amazon. This one has to do with another manufacturer that took control of their own kind of channel. Tell us about this one. Yeah, this one is uh, was was a different situation. This is a manufacturer of pneumatic tools. So pneumatics are basically air tools. They're used in commercial industrial applications. Some DIY people use them at home, not too many. We think about abrasives, right? Or, or a sander or, or you know, those air guns that shoot yep. nails, that sort of thing. But it's all, you know, a lot of it's used in production lines and auto body, you know, repair, things like that. They basically improve surfaces, right? They finish surfaces, whether that's metal, wood, what have you. So this company a couple of years ago was faced with a situation where they had dozens and dozens and dozens of companies selling their products on Amazon and they had no idea who these companies were. So, you know, this is a common thing with branded manufacturers where they won't know who the, you know, who the resellers are on Amazon. And it's a pain point because oftentimes those resellers, uh, in order to win the sale on Amazon, they'll just drop the price. That's the only advantage yep. they have. That's the only way they can, what they call, win the buy box, right, on Amazon. So this company, you know, had this situation where they were getting complaints from their traditional dealers, like, you know, the big distributors out there and retailers and dealers that were carrying their products. Because, you know, they'd, they'd find product on Amazon, the dealer or distributor would, that was below the price that this company is offering to sell it to them for. Because these folks would get, you know, a few extra units and they'd be sitting in their garage, these resellers, and they'd put them up at, you know, below what the, you know, what, what the prices were just to get the sale. And so they were dealing with all this channel conflict, which was, and they said, well, hey, we're not selling on Amazon. We're not, well, yeah, but I see it on Amazon. And it's <laughs> like, 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 yes. So it's this crazy situation where they, they, you know, they had, they had to get control of it. Right. So they also realized that their products, their product and their brand names we're getting enormous amounts of search on Amazon. So, you know, Amazon, again, is a search engine and it's a place where people go to buy, you know, research and buy product. And what's happening in the market, and this was happening to this company, is that when they searched on, you know, sort of general terms related to their product category, like pneumatic sander or what have you, you would see all these products. That, and these are companies they'd never competed with before showing up yes. on Amazon from brands they didn't know. And they're doing, we have tools that run this stuff, they're doing millions of dollars in sales on individual products, these brands, and they're and they're not all cheap product either. And a lot of it's coming out of Asia. And it's it's really fascinating what's happening. The competitive dynamic is changing. So not only did they not know who was selling their product on Amazon, they also have all these new competitors coming in, taking share from them on Amazon. So they had to fix this. <laughs> So, so we helped them do it. Essentially, what we did was, was several things. We inventoried, you know, the resellers. We first looked at who the heck these people were. You know, the good news is these days is you can find out, you know, who a lot of the sellers are. And this isn't restraint of free trade. This is just managing the strategy of the channel more effectively. So they decided we're going to get in and create a proactive program here. We want to sell directly and control our destiny on the number one search engine in, in the United States, arguably the world. And so they instituted a number one a, a inventory of this. Then they we helped them put a foundation of channel control in place. And so we talk about this. Um, it's really about making sure that you have a well-structured distribution strategy for how and where your products are sold. This is all 
you know, legal, a lot, you know, law, there are legal specialists that work with this. We often find ourselves working with, you know, the law, the law practices or the law internal legal counsel at our clients, where we're helping them establish distribution policies, internet policies for resale. There's something called MAP, minimum advertised price policies, mm-hmm. which are, can be put in place. And there's some, there's some other things you have to, you know, when you do this work, you have to overcome some of the Sherman Antitrust Act and Langham Act, or there's these, these federal statutes that govern free trade in the United States that varies internationally. But at the end of the day, there's a legal structure and, and a business structure you can put in place that will help you manage this and regain a level of control over your brand presence on Amazon. There's a, something called Amazon Brand Registry, which allows you to do that, as well as manage the uh, the retail pricing that's that's displayed. So this company launched a direct selling program. They launched a brand and, and content management program for Amazon. They have gained control of the channel. So they've authorized specific resellers for Amazon, which is great because then when a company, when a customer buys the product on Amazon, they can now be assured that it comes with the, the warranty, the guarantees, the service is necessary. These are complex products that require service, just like our lawnmower company we talked about. And so there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of goodness in the customer side in terms of making sure they're getting what they're paying for and, and they're getting the brand promise that the, that the manufacturer puts out there. So counterintuitively, Steve, when you think about you know having a proactive Amazon program actually reduces the channel conflict in the case of this manufacturer and has led to that. They have had no issues with their dealer base, their dealer base and distributors applaud it. They feel like they're more strategic now in working with their key distributors and, and dealers. Their, their dealers have told them that. And so they're a huge fan of this approach to, to ad- addressing this. They're in a much better situation than they were a couple of years ago. Yep. It's always interesting, you know, the, the delicacies around the power of e-commerce. I remember I was, this wasn't a B2B company I worked for, it was B2C and they had a sales force and all of a sudden, when we wanted to sell online, it was kind of like, wait a second, you're taking away my sales. So it's always just this inherent conflict. And we actually, in this example, we worked out a pretty good solution in that we just said, look, if you had, you know, if your quota was for 100 sales this month, and we took five of those people from your, you know, territory, we would remove those five from the goal of 100. We would acknowledge that, okay, yes. We've, we've done like the address matching and yes, this was a customer that would have bought from you. And I like that solution because it acknowledged, look, we're not going to not sell online. Like it's, it's stupid if we were to not do that. Right. But, but we also acknowledge that it does impact your, you know, footprint that you're operating in. All right. Case study number three, we're going to not jump on the manufacturing side. This one is about the distributor side. You get it's kind of fascinating. You get to work with all different angles here and I guess the distributor is lucky to have you on their side because you could go any route when it comes to e-commerce sales. All right, case study number three, take it away. Yeah, so case study three, Steve, has to do with a distributor. Now, you know, selling on Amazon. Well, wait a minute. If I'm a distributor, what the heck am I doing selling on Amazon? (laughs) Right? Because, you know, you could argue that a distributor is just hastening their own demise, (laughs) If they do sell on Amazon, but quite frankly, you know, a, a couple things that you have to recognize. I think if you're a distributor, number one, Amazon is setting the bar. It certainly has in B two C, and now is in B two B with 35 billion in sales on B two B transactions annually. Amazon is setting the bar for the B two B e commerce experience. Right, they're bringing the same kinds of functionalities and everything else to the B two B buyer, and they're filling a gap. Quite frankly, that most distributors are not. So, you know, in terms of the, the efficiency, making the buyer's job easier, that's what Amazon does. And so they're doing that in B2B. And if a distributor, you know, if a distributor sells on Amazon, you could argue, well, heck, you know, they're doing it better than me. Why the heck do I want to sell there? Well, number one, you've got to learn what Amazon is doing. And the best way to do that is to sell on Amazon, right? So that said, I think also there's a real, really strong business case for distributors to sell on Amazon. So let's, we, we announced earlier this year in my thought leadership series, Master B2B, that we, that the, this is this is the year of uh, one of our predictions, the year of the distributor squeeze, right? So what does that mean? The distributors are under pressure from a lot of points. Number one, you've got manufacturers selling directly. You've also got, you know, the marketplaces. So Amazon certainly is, is one, one aspect of that. You've also got vertical marketplaces that have emerged that are filling the gap that a lot of distributors traditionally are not. They're ahead of them with e-commerce. And so distributors are under a lot of pressure. So if we think about what can a distributor do in a market like this? Well, one of the things that the smart distributors are doing 
is they are launching private label product, number one. Number two, they're buying their suppliers, which is a, roughly equivalent to that. And then they're also partnering with their suppliers, who many of these manufacturers are slow to market with e-commerce. They're partnering with them to essentially become their e-commerce and Amazon arm, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going out and they're saying, hey, supplier, let me enable you on Amazon. You don't want to deal with, you know, potential blowback from your distributor from your distribu distributor channel. Let me be your Amazon, appoint me your exclusive or semi-exclusive Amazon seller. A lot of distributors are thinking about this and a lot of manufacturers are very open to that discussion and because they want to empower their traditional distributors and help them succeed in e-commerce. So this distributor I'm talking about is a mid-market industrial distributor. We helped them launch on Amazon a program focused on in two areas. One was their private label products, which they make and source. Some of them they make themselves, some of them they source in private label products, and we set them up and selling them through Amazon Seller Central using Amazon's Fulfilled by Amazon service. So you get the prime, you know, two-day shipping and all that. And then the other thing we did was we went back to some of their suppliers and we said, hey, supplier, you're not selling on Amazon at all. It's an uncontrolled mess on Amazon for you. Your brand is being degraded. Your price is going through the toilet. You know, hey, we'll help you fix that. So we went with them to their suppliers and we got them, in some cases, uh, some exclusivity on some product together with them based on their relationships to sell these products on Amazon and be that manufacturer, supplier's Amazon partner, right? And so they have, they have close to a $10 million Amazon program now. It's incredible. And it's more profitable than it ever was. They had a small Amazon program before. And the reason is because they're they're working with their channel and they're managing, they're helping them to manage their map policies, their minimum advertised price policies. They're managing the, you know, the whole presence with the content and everything else on on Amazon for them. And the supplier's happy and they're happy. And they're learning for their own e-commerce, right? That's the yep. other piece that I mentioned earlier. So it's a win for for all parts of the supply chain there. You know, three cases that are just really interesting. It's the dynamics of channel sales and B2B. It's it's just it was once so simple. So it's fascinating to see how complex it's gotten. All right, we're going to transition over to Q and A. So my first question for you: Tell me about your first marketing job. Oh gosh, my first marketing job was <laughs> call it marketing it was ecom. You know, it was my career, but it, it had a lot of marketing in it. It was really focused on furniture. So we're talking. We're going to go back to <laughs> two thousand and three, I think, or four, I came into a small company that was selling furniture online. We were competing with what is now Wayfair, if you know what Wayfair is. Yes, sir. They were a small company like we were. They raised a lot of money. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're rather large now, and we are not. <laughs> we, that business is not even in business anymore. But my first marketing gig was was that I was running all the e-commerce marketing and website experience for this, you know, this privately held it was a family owned business. It was in the furniture business. We were, we were drop shipping furniture to, uh, and we had a hundred or 150, you know, furniture manufacturers that we went to and they would place an order on our website and we would drop ship it. But my marketing, I learned a ton about marketing in that job because I, it was all about the time it was all about search engine marketing. It was SEO. Yeah. Amazon was nascent. It was tiny. And it was all about Google. You had to get to page one on Google. And we, at the time, 2003, four, if you put up a website that was really focused on one category, like we did, we had totalbedroom.com, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so total bedroom, guess what? Number one in Google for, for like bedroom furniture, bedroom sets, platform bed. That thing went from zero to number one in Google in like yeah. a month. You can't do that anymore. But it was, uh, it, was, it was amazing. So we launched all these little sites. And so did Wayfair. That's the same strategy they had for years. They were called CSN stores. For a long time and they would do the same thing we would compete with them we'd be number one they'd be number two and vice versa that went on for about four or five years and then they raised about a trillion dollars and cremated us you know the, the decision to take on outside capital is always a scary one i mean you have a family-owned business you know they're wary of the sharks who sometimes just have a have a three to five year window of when they want to actually do something with the company and then and then exit it so yep it's a, it's a tough decision what do you you know you've been in a really competitive channel most of your career, like what do you what do you enjoy about the competitiveness that you're seeing? Well, what I love about well, just being a competitive person <laughs> that helps, <laughs> you know, to be in a competitive field that's always changing. I, I love the challenge of of understanding and testing and and learning what's next. 
when I was an operator, Steve, meaning when I was the head of e-commerce, different companies, one of my favorite things to do was to do, to do um, testing, multivariate testing, understanding based on data, what the customer's preferences were. That's valid today on Amazon and other places and in B2B as well. But, you know, when I was in the e-commerce field, we would have, I mean, running e-commerce, we would have, in some cases, millions of people in our database. We would have, you know, a lot of site traffic coming to the site. So we were able to test things both on the marketing and messaging side, as well as on the merchandising side in our e-commerce experiences. And we could very quickly learn what the customer's preferences were. And the neat thing was, you know, was, was getting a win. It was a lot of fun when something happened. And I would always challenge my teams. I'd say, guys, which one do you think is going to win? Which one's not, yeah. you know? So invariably, I was always wrong. You know, that was, the, that was the fun part is data just tells you so much about, you know, what, uh, what the customer's preferences are. And, you know, we see the same things these days in B2B that it's still somewhat early, a lot of this testing and, and, and learning approach. The one that's the company that has done that well is, of course, is Amazon. It has the pockets to do it, testing and learning different programs. But to me, the one of the most fun parts is really that, you know, the data driven approach that, you know, helps us to make the best decision for the customer. Where do you see Amazon going down the road, right? Like most people would describe Amazon as a frenemy. You need them, but you don't like that they take a big chunk out of your out of your sales. Where do, you, where do you think they'll go to, to kind of, you know, they obviously need to continue to grow their business, but they can't alienate companies. What, what's their next kind of play? Well, you know, it's interesting. Amazon looks for, you know, you saw, it's interesting. You saw Jassy and the CEO of, of Amazon talk about Amazon business for the first time in their shareholder letter. That's never been, never been talked about. Bezos never talked about Amazon business. So in, B2B is clearly one thing they're leaning into heavily because it's, it's become the fastest growing part of Amazon. So what Amazon does, though, is they look for inefficiency that can be solved by what they're best in the world at, which is really technology, relevancy of the customer experience, making the buyer's job easier, and then looking at you know these new categories. So they'll get into and test a lot of different things. You've seen their forays into healthcare. I'm sure, you know, AWS, Amazon Web Services was a, has been traditionally a huge business for them, very successful. Amazon advertising, you know, for the marketers here, Amazon advertising is an enormous profit center for Amazon now. And so, you know, they're going to be leaning into those things. I think where we are near term with Amazon is there's a focus on profitability. There's a focus on making sure that they're being mindful of, you know, where the business really is succeeding. They're still going to test and learn, but they're getting looks to me like they're getting more disciplined around where they're where they're doubling down, right? So B2B advertising, they've recently cut back on some of the healthcare investments. You may have seen that. So where does Amazon go from here? Well, I think they continue to, that focus, they continue testing and learning, but in a more focused manner. I think they will continue to penetrate new businesses and try new things. But here's an interesting stat for you. Like if you look at, for example, their private label business, right? So, you know, all these manufacturers are terrified of, Amazon going in and taking, learning from their products and yep. going in and coming out with their own private label. Okay, fine. They've done that in a few cases, but guess what? This is not very profitable because, you know, think about these products that you're doing. It's com they're commodity products, right? So commodity products inherently are less profitable. There's not a lot of margin in them. They want to bring more value to the Amazon customer. Well, guess, you know, sure. Okay, great. It's all about the customer. But at the end of the day, you've also got this pressure to be profitable. So I, I think, and, and they've already announced some scale back in some of the private label product last year. So I think, you know, that, that whole fear of uh, teaching Amazon a business Number one, you're not going to teach Amazon anything. Amazon will learn if they want to. And uh, number two, it's it's they're realizing some aspects of their business that just aren't aren't necessarily in the best long term interest of Amazon and its shareholders yep. and, and its customers. So yep. it, so anyway, I think you're going to see some changes, some pivots around some of those things as well. Okay. All right. Final question. So this is a advice you have to give the audience. So if someone is in a position where they've contemplated e-commerce to complement their existing sales or distribution relationships, but they're still nervous and they don't want to be the person that starts this initiative because it's just, it's too risky, right? What are some things that you can tell them to ease them into it? Well, you know, it's kind of getting back to one of the case studies I shared. This always depends on the size of the company and the and the structure and where you sit in that structure. If you're the CEO, I'd tell you to get, get over it and get some people around you that, that can help you implement e-commerce and digital and you just need to drive change and it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's a good thing. That's not bad. <laughs> it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be a, you're going to have some folks in your business that are going to potentially resist. Your sales team may say, hey, you're taking our sales away. Your channel, your channel team might say, hey, you're going to, you're going to destroy all of our traditional channels. 
Not true. So I would say get over it. If you're in a different position in the company, it, then it comes down to, you know, kind of crawl, walk, running into it and building a case really for, again, getting back to that case study. Amazon is a great place to start with this because you can, if you do it well, you can, you can maintain your pricing. You can gain control of the channel. You, the infrastructure, the traffic is already there and you can build that organizational muscle around e-commerce using a pre-existing infrastructure that Amazon delivers. And there's best practices there. You don't have to invest as much in technology as if you do it yourself. So I argue Amazon's a good place to start. That said, if you are in an organization where you know, you're know you fighting and, and, and there's, there's a C-suite that just does not get it and will not change, will not allocate any investment, find another job. Yep. Always, you know what? That's great advice. My wife is at a conference once. She started out as a CFO in her current role, and she was she told a really good story about a, it was a CFO conference, and we were talking about like the relationships between CFOs and CEOs, and that was the advice of of this CFO is like if your CEO doesn't want to be a partner, doesn't want to talk long term, just wants to transact, get a new job. You don't want that job, yeah. and it's right. just it's just good advice. Sometimes you got to know when to just say, all right, it's not a good fit. I'm out. All yeah. right. And speaking of I'm out, that is my segue into the conclusion for the podcast. I really enjoyed the conversation today. I loved opening my own mind into the world of B2B e-commerce. And if anyone from Boeing is listening, perhaps by the end of next month, they'll put a Dreamliner up on on Amazon. We'll, we'll be the first. We'll have inspired the first commercial airline. I don't know. Is that a is that a half a billion dollar purchase? I'm not sure. I'm not well versed in the probably in the Dreamliner space, but. Uh, Anyway, Brian, I really enjoyed your conversation and thank you to everyone for listening to today's show. Take care. Thanks, dude. Thanks for tuning in to the interesting B2B Marketers podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. If you found value in today's episode, please help grow the podcast by sharing with others and leaving a review. We'll see you next time.